to my channel. If you're new here, my name's Allie. Please subscribe down below if you haven't yet. If you already have subscribed, I love you so much. I am right now on my way to go meet Rachel to do her interview, the Where Are They Now? Rachel edition, episode six, five, six, episode six. Um, Rachel is such a beautiful young woman. I told you this in my last video. I'm so excited to do this. I love doing these recaps with you guys, and I know you guys love them as well. So um, make sure to subscribe for more, and uh, yeah, stay tuned. It's hard when your all your whole family's telling me, oh, you know, you, you can, you gotta tell Chris, he gotta go, he has to go do this, he has to go do this. Your family wants you to go into treatment, but then what about me? The past five months hasn't just been you, and the things that I've been doing has done a lot of damage to me. Wipe your teeth. You can edit that, right? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So when me and Rachel did her interview, we only had like a certain amount of time really to hang out and chat. Um, and she really wanted to make sure that I got a few points across to you guys. And um, a lot of it is to her family. And so I really wanted to do that at the beginning of this video to make sure that everyone saw it and knows how important this is to her. Because um, she was really excited to tell her story. But, you know, she wants to make a few things clear. So uh, this is what Rachel sent to me to read to you guys. She said, I want to just say that telling my story, I really hope that it helps the victims of rape, bullying, domestic violence, teen pregnancy, depression, and addiction. To show you all that you are not alone and that no matter how hard it may seem or how alone you may feel, that there are people out there that love you and there is a way out. Do not give up even if you feel like that is the only option left. We need to stick together and keep on fighting so we can come out on top and show the next person that it's possible. Because if we give up, who's going to show the next person that it's possible? I also want to say I love everyone who still stands in my corner, especially my family. I know that the things I've done hasn't just affected me personally, but the people closest to me as well, especially to my mom. Thank you for making your number one priority, taking care of my son and surrounding him with so much love and giving him the life that I hope one day I will be able to give him as well. And I am so grateful that it's you and Jay who he looks up to. It makes my heart hurt a little less to see how happy and smart he is because of you. And to that, I can never express how much I will always be forever grateful and to my dad, you are always there for me, especially when I just need someone to talk to or to cry to. You are always the one telling me not to give up. And you keep pushing me forward because you still see the potential I have. And that alone has got me through some seriously hard times where all I wanna do is give up. I hope one day I can be a part of the family again and mend the hearts I have broken and repay the time I have taken from you, consuming your lives of the constant mistakes that have taken your daughter from you. I just want you to know I love you all and can't wait to have you back in my life and to be the daughter you both deserve and to be the mom to my son that I so badly want to be, but most importantly, the mom that he deserves as well. And so I just wanted to make sure I got that in here in the beginning of the video and so yes now we can proceed hi guys I have rachel here so excited right <laughs> so today basically we're just gonna do like a little like where are they now i'm excited though because rachel okay so we'll go more into it but like rachel was on the show i was like desperately like trying to like love her i wanted to kind of start what with got you here and basically your like childhood yeah if you can call it a childhood because it yeah. was so adult like yeah i was like 12. that's like when everything started where are you from i'm from upstate new york right outside of albany in a town called east Greenbush. i think even growing up for me like i can even kind of look back like when i was a child i would throw drums like laying down on my floor, kicking the door. I would even say, like, my mom brought this up to me the other day, how I would say at like eight years old, like, nobody loves me except my dog. I'm gonna eat peanut butter and die. I'm, I'm allergic to peanut oh, butter. Okay. So 
I would threaten to kill myself at like eight oh years God. old. And when like, were both your parents together at this point? I was in fifth grade. My parents split up and my mom had a boyfriend immediately. Uh -huh. um, and they had a long distance relationship because he lived in New Hampshire. And from that side, from my mom's side, I had a lot of love. My stepdad's like a, another dad figure in my life. Yeah. My dad, on the other hand, I love him to death, but like I felt like he would have new girlfriends come in. And so that's what you were kind of doing. You were traveling with your mom. She had a nice boyfriend who was yeah. like a dad figure. You have a brother and a sister. Yeah, both older than me. Okay, so you're the youngest. And then you go into high school. Had you done any drugs prior to high school? No. Maybe smoked pot a couple times, but I really didn't like it. Were you like in any sports or anything? I grew up doing cheerleading, lacrosse, uh, basketball. And then as soon as I went into high school, I stopped all of that. So it's freshman year, pink picture. You have lots of friends or like what? The same group of friends from like fifth grade. Probably like a month into freshman year, we'd go in her basement and we'd sneak people down there and get mm -hmm. drunk and get smoke, lit. whatever. Yeah. The one time I asked this guy to come over. And, and you had like a crush on him? No, I basically just like knew about him. It was me and two other people and they both had guys with them, so I asked this one guy to just come over. Right. I just remember texting him, and then I just remember waking up and me being on top of him. So he comes over, you guys are obviously drinking. Drinking four locos, and I just remember- I, Always dangerous. Yeah. I had blacked out, and I just remember waking up on the couch on top of him. And what were your friends doing? They were just in the room. I can't remember exactly, but they were all there. And they told me like afterwards, like that, he just came in the house, came downstairs, and like picked me up and put me on top of him, basically. So that's how I lost my virginity. What did it feel like when you woke up to like that? Like when you came to, to like um, that situation? Like what was like your immediate thought or like feeling? I don't even think it really hit me. Or like I didn't even, I for a really long time, I never really wanted to even consider it rape because mm -hmm. I felt like I texted him, right. told him to come over, and Obviously, there was like some motive of me texting him and telling him to come over, but so I kind of like never really thought it was his fault. As I mentioned, I am going to be commentating on this video a little bit because I think it's really important, and especially during this part when Rachel is talking about how she was raped uh, when she was a freshman in high school. I think it's super important to let her know that she is not alone by any means. Um, especially with the statistics that every 98 seconds, somebody in America is sexually assaulted. One out of every six American women have been the victim of an attempted or completed rape, and the majority of child victims are ages 12 to 17. Beyond that, there was a study of women 14 years and older who had non-consensual sex, and over 60% of them did not believe that they were victims. And I feel like that's important to touch on because Rachel is going to tell more about her story and this was obviously a huge turning point in her life that really impacted uh, at least, you know, at a minimum, the next few years to come. For the next day, I went over to his house willingly and like it happened again. And then that week in school, I just remember my, just everyone rushing up to me telling me that like, it's going around school that you had sex and this and that. Mm -hmm. And my brother found out cause he was in the same high school. He was just two grades higher than me. Right. And he busted into my classroom, like while class was oh going on, like screaming at me, <laughs> telling me to get out of the classroom and come talk to him and this and that. And he was, Peyton was 18, 19, and I was 12 or 13. Oh my God. My brother already told the police officer that was in the school, the guy that I had been with, he was already on house arrest for selling drugs. And so they put me in the principal's office. The cop was in there. He was like, we have to call your dad and tell him. He came to the school and my dad like tried fighting him. It was horrible. My dad forced me to go to the cops and I was I just remember I was in the detective room whatever them asking me questions for like 12 hours and they made me like set them up on a phone call 
and I felt horrible. Like mm -hmm. I didn't want to do any of it. Right. And I tried at the beginning to like say like I was the one that tried. Like I didn't want him to but get in trouble. But it's still like this man is 19 yeah. years old, right? And knowingly he's talking to a 12, 13 yeah. year old girl. Comes I found, over, knows you're intoxicated, and so I found out says, at the end yeah. that he just wanted to get laid however many times before he was going to go to jail. So he got arrested. Everyone knew that he was like popular, and I was then known as the girl that put him in jail and claimed rape and all of the rumors of that. I said he roofied me, that this and that, and. I threw everyone under the bus and that's not how it went at all yeah like I didn't go to school for like a week because it, my dad wanted it to die down but mm -hmm. I still got in trouble for it I shouldn't have been drinking they looked at all the problems that I did I was grounded for this I was grounded for that now did they ever talk to you about like no. all of these things like drinking no. drugs sex like they never had like the talk no with you. when Rachel was talking about how bad she was bullied and harassed after being uh, taking advantage of by this man, it like made me so sad and angry. Harassment and bullying used to be so different when I was in school. When I was in school, yeah, people were bullied and fights happened, but it usually ended when the bell rang at the end of the day. Now, and a lot of people say it, these kids can't escape each other. And it's easy an adult to say, well, block them. Well, blocking doesn't work when there's a gang mentality and people are making fake profiles and, you know, doing all sorts of crazy stuff to just like really hurt another person mentally. Imagine losing your virginity like that and then that leading into this cascade of harassment and nonstop bullying and not feeling safe anywhere that you went. I have to tell you guys, the third leading cause of death for kids ages 10 to 14 is suicide, which is a, how old Rachel was when this all happened. So talk to your kids. Just want to throw that in there. Bullying is fucking bullshit. And if you're that kid in school that stands up for the kid that everyone's like picking on, like good for fucking you, you're going places. This girl has been through so much and it's only going to get crazier. Um, but I know that you guys aren't bullies and you guys are full of love and support. And uh, so that's why she's telling us her story. So I love you guys so much and I'll see you probably in like a few minutes. <laughs> I always seeked approval and felt like I never really fit in and like... Trying to make friends. And yeah, that's trying... what they're doing. Yeah, and like I was, I was more of a follower. Like, yeah. I just wanted people to like me. Right. And then after that, like... I couldn't walk in the halls without people telling me to go kill myself or you should go die. Anonymous accounts on Facebook and tell me like they know where I live and that I have what's coming to me. Like I didn't feel safe anywhere. My mom tried putting me in like therapy and I just would not talk. Like yeah. I wouldn't say. I already got him in this much trouble. Yeah. That was like at 12 years old. Yeah. So that to me like already like fucked me up in the head. Okay, so that's how you lost your virginity. Now, after that, how long did it take you to maybe like trust to maybe be in some sort of relationship again or get over that? Okay, so next guy, he was over into drugs. The bad guys yet. Yes. Are you sure? Yes. Do you ever really get over bad boys? I'm like just not even interested in guys <laughs> right now. I'm 10, 16 and I started talking to my son's father, Justin. He was 21. And I tried to hide it for a while because I knew my parents how were going to be was it, How long did you go being able to hide it? Probably a couple months. Because when a high schooler's in love, yeah, there's was, no hiding it. Like, he was my first love. Like, yeah. so in love. All I wanted for my 16th birthday was for my mom to meet him. Like, that's mm -hmm. all I asked for. He was known as, like, a heroin addict, a junkie, dropped out of school. He had a really bad bringing up. Like, his dad died, his grandma died, so he was left all this money and yeah. just turned to drugs. But like, Was when, he sober when you guys yeah. were together? Okay, so when he was sober met. and he treated you well? At first. Did he meet your mom on your 16th birthday? 
Yeah. Okay, and what did she think? We went on our first date, like real wow. date. And my mom like liked him and she brought him in as like his own and like mm-hmm. when I would go to my dad's house he would stay at my mom's house and my brother and him like became best friends and he basically lived at my mom's. And then they my parents started to see bruises on me and I kind of say oh no we were play fighting or this and that he had his own apartment and then he started drinking and getting like really angry he'd like just throw me up against the wall or choke me or just repeatedly punch me in the same spots and i just would forgive him and like i blame myself like if i didn't do this he wouldn't have done it or like i didn't want to lose him for whatever reason and then i got pregnant i was 16 about to turn 17. So how long had you guys been together when you got pregnant? Almost a year. I found out I was pregnant like a day before his birthday in December and I didn't want to tell any of my family because I didn't want to ruin Christmas for anyone. I didn't right. want to ruin the holidays. So you felt guilty? About I knew that? my parents were not gonna be okay with it. Yeah. So I think in like January I told my sister and my brother. And they say. My brother was excited and my sister was like, you need to tell mom or else I'm going to. Oh my God. So I was upstairs in my room and I texted her. You texted her? Yeah. Rachel, who does that? I would kill my fucking kid. Oh I my was God. so scared. I was like, <laughs> I, I was like, mom, I need to tell you something. I know you're going to be so upset, but, and she's like, you're pregnant. And she knew. Yeah. She could like tell. Yeah. Moms have like a sixth sense. Okay. So I went downstairs and it was oh. just like like Justin, get out of the house. Rachel, like if you don't get an abortion, like I'm not gonna be okay. I'm not I'm not on board with it. Right. So I had it I felt like I had to choose between him and my family, basically. Like I dreamt of like the picture of like people having a baby and like having a family of their own and like mm-hmm. growing up I didn't really feel like the love and affection. I didn't have the family that I wanted. I was kind of like the black sheep and felt like I didn't have as much love as they did. So you were kind of hoping that you could build your own yeah. family and maybe uh, like, you think he was going to like start Yeah, because he never had a family growing up. So right, so you're giving me. both of you guys. Yeah, and then... But how did he react? Was he excited? Or yeah. What? Okay. He was, and but I just remember one night I got really mad at him because... I can't remember what happened, but I just remembered he like punched me in my stomach knowing I was pregnant and like choked me until I passed out. And I like told him like, you need to get help or you're not gonna be in your kid's life. Yeah. I was so angry, like how could you do this to me knowing that I'm pregnant? Then on the whole other side of things with my mom, I chose to go to my ultrasound instead of the abortion and that pissed her off. So you lived with her at the time. Yeah. And she She wouldn't talk to me. She I would try talking to her and she like would completely ignore me. And did she say like, you know, why? Like as a parent I could imagine you like want so much for your kid, you know. My mom just said this just isn't what she wanted for me and like I thought my dad was gonna be more pissed off than my mom, but it was the opposite way. My mom was so pissed off and my dad was more like told me to think about my options. They knew what was happening with Justin. And I kept giving him chance after chance after chance after chance. And my mom told me, because I was a senior, pregnant. I graduated eight months pregnant. And she told me, like, if you want, after you graduate high school, we can move to New Hampshire so she can be with her boyfriend. She said, I'll get a house so you and Mason can have your own room. And... She did, and I moved with her. And the boyfriend stayed behind? Yeah. So he went to the first appointment, and that was it. Okay. So after that, I'd either go to appointments alone, or I remember after telling my family, like, I'm not going to be with him, my mom started to come around a little. And be more supportive. Yeah. Okay. So she came with me to the gender reveal, Mm -hmm. and. You found out it was a boy. I did. And how did you feel? I was excited, but. I will say that my entire pregnancy, I wanted to kill myself. I was so depressed and like I didn't talk about it. I like made it seem like I was really happy and mm-hmm. like. What do you think that stemmed from? Me being pregnant, I didn't think of it as me being a single mom at 17. Yeah. And like 
wanting Justin to be there so bad and like he didn't want to and I didn't even think that he didn't want to but he was just so caught up in his life that he didn't mm -hmm. he couldn't stop yeah what do you have to say to like a girl right now who might be like experiencing what you went through like you know, teen any, pregnancy yeah. in general if I knew what was gonna happen after all the years since I had my son I feel like I wish I gave him to a family that could have raised him better than I could have because I haven't been there. But I don't regret having him at all. Like, he's my motivation. Like, I love him so much. It's just really emotional because I want so badly to be there and I want so badly to be his mom. But, like, having drugs in my life and having, like, everything that happened to me and the reason I turned to drugs is, and, like, I chose that over him and then I couldn't stop it. I wish things went differently, but just all the events that happened in my life, something was bound to happen, whether it was me harming myself or me turning to something else. Yeah. And I wish I cut Justin off as soon as the abuse started and I just had my son and focused on myself but I couldn't let it go. Do you think it would have helped to talk about it? Yeah. yeah. After I moved to New Hampshire the condition was that I had to put a restraining order against Justin and that he couldn't be involved and that I'd have to cut him out, can't talk to him, nothing. So I did that. I graduated school eight months pregnant, moved to New Hampshire, had my son August 8th. Oh yeah, yesterday was his birthday. Did you finish the project you were making yeah, for him? Yeah, I did. I'm not even gonna lie, like the past couple days have been really hard and I haven't talked to my son since January. She won't let me talk to him. Like I can't even like say hi to him over the phone. They don't send me pictures of him. Like I have to see it all over Facebook and I just feel like I'm trying so hard to say sober and like, yeah. and then that like, guy asked her, can I just say like happy birthday to him? And she was like, no. So I wasn't able to even like, no one like, and you'd think too, like your family would reach out to you just to see how you are because it's your son's birthday and you can't talk to him. Yeah. No one reached out to me. So I just felt like really shitty yesterday. Like the first year of my son's life, I was there, but I like wasn't there mentally was so focused on like trying to get Justin back and trying to get him to want to be in our lives and like I just talked to him behind my mom's back and I was living a double life yeah uh, it's what's so important about like living in whatever's happening now because I was so was focused like on like what I wanted instead and, of focused mm, on what mm, you had yeah. yeah when Mason turned a year old my mom threw him a big birthday party she was always there she was so supportive mm -hmm. she'd help me were you still depressed? Yeah. yeah. And, and okay, so how old were you when you had Mason? I just turned seventeen. Um, okay, so, so you go through tough high school, you get pregnant, you leave dealing with depression. Yeah, de serious depression. Like leaving, major depression. Like having a second chance, like my mom giving me another chance to like have start a life with my son. Yeah. And, like, in Doing, New Hampshire. Yeah, with her help and with her support. Awesome. But I couldn't let Justin go. So after my son turned a year old, I got into a huge fight with my mom. And I think I knew I was doing it to get, like, kicked out on purpose because I wanted to go you be with Justin. Reason. Yeah. So I picked up Mason. I picked up myself. I put what I could in the car. I drove to New York knowing that I was going to be in a homeless shelter with Justin. And I was like, okay with it. Justin didn't work, I went right to work and I like just started saving money and I got us our own place. Me taking care of him and Mason because he couldn't hold the job. Mm -hmm. And and from what I know of you, you always are the one to like put in the work, get the place because you want to keep everyone happy. happy. But, but you're like always, Sad. Yeah. Yeah. So you did that with them. 
And what were you doing for work in New York? I was working at Hooters. Okay. And, um... And what did you feel about that then? I, I was... I would work at Hooters. I was, I was okay with it. <laughs> I, did you ever think that you would go further than that? This girl that worked there that gave me, an, like, she was like, you can come to New York City with me to, like, escort. I never went and did it, but I always, like, was like, I could be okay with doing that. Like, mm -hmm. it's okay. Was he good at all when you got back, or was he still abusive when you returned? No, abusive. As soon as I got a place for us, I was working so hard, like, working doubles and like, just working more. I mm -hmm. wanted to make sure all our bills are paid, like didn't have any government support like I was just I'm sure you wanted it. to show your mom like hey yeah like I can do it you know five months and like me not being able to take it anymore I did a couple of police reports of him like beating me and like punching me in the face so you did call the like you did yeah, call the police a couple yeah. times good and um we were driving and he just like decked me in the face while we were driving and Mason was in the car. So and dangerous. I went to my dad's house and he was like, Rachel, if you aren't going to file a report, you can just leave. Like, we're trying to help you and you're not yeah. seeing it. Right. So I called the authorities and like, they basically told me there that making a report wasn't going to be that big of a deal and not much action could be taken. Like someone punching a dog in the face would be more effective than like a guy hitting a girl. Yeah. That's what they how they explained wow. it to me. So I called my mom and I was like, "Please, like, let me move back. Like, I'm begging you. Like, I, I'm gonna die here. Like, please." And she was like, "Rachel, like, this is the choice you made. Like, I tried helping you, so she like didn't help me." I remember my stepdad's cousin. She came and helped me clear out the place, and moved me to her house in New Hampshire. Okay, like, so her. Third chance. Of yeah. me like trying to start over mm -hmm. and I still couldn't let it go I was literally maybe there for like a couple weeks and she literally paid my debt off like put a credit card in my name so I could pay my bills and build my credit up and mm -hmm. she'd pay that Wow. Um, set me up for a job at a bank paid for child care like told wow. me all this stuff that I could do and like yeah. she was gonna help me get on my feet and get in my own place and I literally every two days, I would make up a reason why I needed to go back to New York. Mm -hmm. And I'd pawn my son off to my friend's mom. Mm -hmm. And I would just party. At this point, I was doing coke because Justin introduced it to me. Mm -hmm. And I was the one that it would be morning time and everyone was going to sleep. And I'd be like, why do you guys want to go to sleep? Like, I want to go down more. Yeah. yeah. Like, depression was still there. I would start thinking like I'm such a horrible mother like I right, hate you would myself feel, like, super depressed and yeah that. like why am I doing this every time I drove in my car I'd look at a tree and I'd be like that's the perfect tree to drive into like that's what I would think in my head and I knew it wasn't like that's not normal what do you think could have been helpful for you at this point do you think like anything could, or anyone could have talked to you or who do you think like could have like maybe or was it inevitable? Or I feel like now, and maybe that this is me just being selfish. Like kids, kids fuck up. Kids yeah. make mistakes, and especially being a single mom and like having this stuff happen to me as a kid. Like, like I just needed love. Like, and I know that my mom gave me a couple chances, but the one thing I wanted was for my mom just to just like take me and like love grab you. me. Yeah. yeah. And like tell me everything's gonna be all right and just help me but like that wasn't it. like that wasn't the case yeah so I felt just like alone and felt like no one was there hey guys so I'm editing this video and I thought I would just like commentate a little bit so at this point Rachel had started over in New Hampshire with her mom and her mom's boyfriend she chose to you know move her and her son back to New York with her son's dad, Justin. At this point, it got very violent, out of control abuse, went to her dad's, and her stepdad's cousin ended up taking her in and allowing her to live in her house with her in New Hampshire. And Rachel, as she said, still couldn't really let go of Justin and was continuing to go to New York 
every two days making up excuses that it's somebody's birthday x y and z to go there and basically party the cousin didn't necessarily know drugs was involved but she knew something was going on so i'm just gonna i just want the whole you know you guys to understand everything so i figured i would commentate while editing this okay you're you're regularly every couple of days going to new york to use party yeah, so Hang the out, last you're time with your, your kid's dad. No, the last time I I dr made that drive, mm -hmm. I met with Justin. He introduced me to crash. How my family found out was because I told Justin I was gonna kill myself, and he like messaged my brother's girlfriend, and they found out I was with Justin. They knew Justin was running, smoking crack, oh. with, and my dad posted a Facebook post trying to find me. Like, and what did the Facebook post, can, like, what did it say? It was pictures of my face, like, being beaten in, like, bruises, like, and then basically explaining that I'm, me and my son are in danger, we can't find her, drugs are involved, this mm -hmm. and that, like, if anyone knows where Rachel is, like, please help us find her. And then my dad was basically texting me, and I confessed, I said I've been smoking crack, like, I kind of was like, this is not what I want to be doing. Hey guys, you have made it this far. Um, I did a poll on Instagram to see if you guys wanted one long video or like three short videos, and you guys voted for one long video, so here you are. And um, at this point in Rachel's life, you know, this is only a few years ago, guys. Like literally, this is about two years ago is where we're at right now. You have to remember, she's only 21. So at this point, she is going to her first treatment center um, her dad, that Facebook post that her dad made literally went viral and you know, she's going to tell us a story about her first treatment experience and what led her down to Florida and how we met. So I hope that you guys are enjoying this so far and I will see you soon. So I drove to my dad's house and he got me into just temporarily like just to detox like and went to my first rehab and completed that and went, ended up on the Cape was doing IOP, living in a sober house. So I relapsed on the Cape mm -hmm. and it was only like a two day run. And How long were you sober before you relapsed? 90 days. Okay, so you had a considerable amount of time. You relapsed yeah. on what? I got kicked out of my sober house. For? Um, getting into a fight with the girl that I was really close with, or like stupid sober house drama. drama. Right. So I started living with some guy that I knew and started stripping. That was like my first time doing that stuff. And like, I didn't end up using until someone from NA like reached out to me and picked me up and he knew what I was doing to make money and put a needle of Coke in front of me and was like, here, why don't you try this? And then I blew Don't it use up. a needle? No. Until that point? So we did that for like two days and I was like, I can't do this. Like I need to call my parents and tell them what happened because this is crazy. And I was stripping and I was like, I just need to go back and like get myself back on track because I like want to be in my son's life. Like that was my main motive. And I think that's always been your motive. Like yeah. since I've known you, like the driving force and I think like what has gotten you through a lot of the tough times has been your son. Yeah. You know, I left the Cape, I went to South Carolina. Okay. Like my sister helped me get on to that rehab and she was like, if you complete it, like you can come live with me with stipulations. Okay. So Sounds fair. I completed it 30 days. So, okay, so you go to treatment, go to the Cape, get 90 days, relapse. briefly relapse for a few days. Go you're back dancing, to your sister says, hey, if you come down here, Mm -hmm. Go to rehab, finish it, come home, live with me. You'll yeah. have some stipulations. Your son's with your mom, and your dad's still supportive of you? Um, yeah, they're both talking to me at this they're point. They're aggravated, like, I'm sure. Yeah, letting but me like, talk to my yeah. son still. Okay. Like, they're still there for me, talking to me. Like, like Rachel will stick it out, whatever. Like, I wasn't, like, it wasn't that many back, back and forth times. Right, right, right. Like, that was my first relapse. Yeah. So, okay, you go to South Carolina. Did 30 days there, completed. My sister picked me up, went to North Carolina where she lives in Raleigh. Mm -hmm. I started working again at Hooters in North Carolina. Like my sister, I kind of had to convince my sister because like my parents always thought like, didn't like the idea of it. Right. So I did good. I was going to meetings. I was saving my money. I was and Hooters, working. like you don't show, you're just like no, a waitress, yeah. but you just dress more yeah. sexy. Like, yeah. Yeah. 
and I liked I liked it so yeah I had fun there so I remember like after a couple of months I started talking to Chris And it was a long distance thing right off the bat. I never he lived met in him New in York, person. right? Yeah. Okay. Never met him in person. You said one of the people that reached out to you and your dad made that Facebook post that you were in danger and Yeah, it was Chris. Was Chris. Who was Like what what was what did he say? What was that? He was just like, I know what you're going through. If you need help with anything, I'm here. Basically now that I look back at of it back at it, it was his like seeing a vulnerable girl and wanting to take her basically like but he was on probation and I kn knew that he like was in rehab before like I didn't know everything mm -hmm. um but you knew that he struggled and yeah. he struggled so I, I'm sure I gave you guys something to like yeah, talk about common. and you had okay and so a five months clean and I told Chris why don't you go turn yourself into the police because you violated probation do jail time and when you get out I'll come pick you up and we can move to Florida together North Carolina or Florida because his family lives down okay, here. okay right his sister's down here okay his so mom, you guys want to share whatever so after Chris got out of jail I came and picked him up we drove to Florida um, his mom let us live there for a couple months and and you're both sober yeah I moved to Florida six months clean mm -hmm. um, and Chris was clean just what I knew, yeah he just got out of jail um, the first week of me living in Florida he came home and I just knew something was wrong and he started to overdose in front of me and I've never seen someone overdose I've never like touched heroin like I didn't know he just starts turning purple and he like I threw him on the bed and he started like how someone over starts overdosing and like his mom just walked through the door and she's a nurse so she started doing CPR on him I'm like freaking out I called 911 they come and narcan him a couple times and then when he woke up and was in the hospital he was telling me it was a Xanax bar that he got and like knowing that I don't have a lot of knowledge on heroin because you had never done it yeah. up to this point so then afterwards like that day he like had me go bring him somewhere to go get drugs and like he like was like do you want to try some and I tried it and I relapsed because my mom actually sent me a petition for full guardianship so I had that on my mind and I was like just fuck it whatever I can try this one in case like, of the fuck it yeah. yeah okay so I tried it and then and I like what what did you did what did you feel it was like probably like the most free from like my depression and like everything like just out of like it I just felt like everything just was lifted off my shoulders mm -hmm. basically and like at this point like I was cam modeling I was stripping like Chris was okay with it and then he started helping me see older gentlemen for money and mm -hmm. like was doing the talking and like setting things up and like helping me go see people and like escort to and um I saved up enough money, got us our own place because he wasn't working because there's always a stipulation with him. So I was taking care of him. Again. Again. Caretaker yeah. role. Yeah. Right. Taking care of him, living in our own place, paying the bills, supporting our drug habit, and our drug habit just got really, like, really bad. I was spending like a grand a day on drugs, like making a grand a day, spending a grand. And was his family aware of everything that was going on with you guys, or were they? Not really, no. No. Okay. And then, like before we did the TV show with you, like, well, our like, relationship. Yeah, what was going on? Like I moved to Florida in November, so I was using from November till March. So, yeah, so however long, however many months that is. Like four, four or five months? Yeah, four or five months, like, it was, it got bad real quick. It was, like, I mean, literally. It was all day. You were meeting guys all day. All day. He basically did. He'd go and then he'd go, no, he did nothing. He did just, nothing. Just other than talk and set things up for me. And he'd yeah. go 
sit in the car or sit in the backyard and when guys would come in and then he'd take the money and go get the stuff and tell me that he needed to go first or he needed this for like he would just take the money and tell me or if we got in a fight he would like go try taking all the money in my bank account saying that it was his money and like we'd fight with each other and like there was that episode didn't show our relationship a lot how our relationship was behind closed doors because everything was about him well i remember even when i was talking to you guys like from day one like you had gone to south carolina to go to treatment oh yeah before the tv show happened i picked up all my stuff yeah he threatened suicide basically if you didn't come Come back yeah he said he was gonna kill himself before i left you told me as soon as you leave i'm gonna kill myself so the whole way there i'm driving i'm thinking oh great when i get to rehab all i'm gonna get a phone call saying that chris killed himself i don't think you understand what that would have done to me like at all you turned around you came home and like but i remember you were really willing to do whatever it was Yeah, because at that point i was so like i didn't want to do it any longer if we're really doing this i want this to be the last fucking time i have to do this ever ever again i just picked up everything that i could fit in my car and i was like i'm not coming back yeah but then he threatened to kill himself so i came back but you were always tiptoeing around his reaction to something. Oh, like, yeah. Even when we would talk, you would, like, be reserved out of fear that he would get angry at something you said, whether yeah. it was about the escorting or whatever. Like, you were never able to, like, truly, like, say, like, hey, like, this is how I feel about it. Like, I feel like... Day one, actions speak louder than words. Okay, all right. I'm not trying to... No, say it's I, fine. I'm not trying to put you down. I'm not trying to make you out to be a bad person. I want this with you, Chris. I really do. I'm being doubted now. No, you're not being doubted. You're not being doubted. Okay. Okay? I love you. He had definitely anger issues. And since we're on the topic of you, like, giving your advice, right? Yeah. What advice would you give a male or female, you know, that is thinking about getting into sex work or escorting. Don't do it. Don't do it. Don't even think about, like, don't even do it because, like, even to this day being sober, I still have thoughts about thinking I can do it sober because of the money I made and thinking, like, oh, it will just help. Just won't, but I can't do it. You, you do it once, and you think you can do it sober, and then you keep doing it, and you can't do it sober, and you start to use. That's, like, a whole other addiction in itself. Yeah. Has yeah. it, like, affected your self-esteem? Or, like, like, what do you think it's... It's made me, like, have a hard time, like, loving myself, and, like, every time I... Because I was seeing like six to ten guys a day for four or five months. And then after we completed the show and went to daylight sober living and then got kicked out for using, we went straight back to using and I went straight back to selling my body. Mm -hmm. And we were living in a motel. And like every single time I did that and slept with another guy, I lost another part of myself. Yeah. And like... Even now, like, to this day, because of the things I've done and, like, even some of the circumstances of me meeting up with certain people, like, certain situations, like, not being safe and, like, Mm -hmm. just whatever. Like, I don't even look at sex now as, like, an intimate thing. It's, like, a job to me. Like, that's how it's, like... It's taken that away. Yeah. That part even away from you. Like, even in a... Were you and Chris sexually active? Like... We were, kind of. It was more, like, pleasing him. Right. Whatever. And he just wasn't appreciative. Make you look at men differently at all, or... I feel like I've just been in so many relationships where I've been... I've given so much, and I've just, like... They haven't looked, like, given me love or, like, haven't, like, treated me like how I see other people in relationships. And, like, Mm -hmm. when I see people, like, both my best friends are... One just had a baby, and the other one's pregnant, my two best friends. And 
they're with their guys and they're like have their own places and it's just like and that's what I want is I want family is I want someone to just treat me like a human being right. and like someone like like Worth being a relationship yeah, yeah being a relationship where it's not just me putting in and like making sure they're happy and like having to tiptoe around because they're either abusive or they're gonna snap or like, I just want to like you one want day a healthy be relationship, yeah. yeah, and like put in what they put in. Yeah. Same thing, and like one day I like someone to love my son the way like mm-hmm. as if there was his own. But like I right now the only thing I'm focused on is getting my son because like that's like the only little boy I need. And I like you tried telling it to me like Rachel like you're not gonna get your son back of Chris, and I was just like yeah yeah like cause I still want mm-hmm. Chris to be there. Yeah. Because I loved him a lot more than I think. I don't think he really, really realized how much you did love him and how much you did for him, you know? I think he loved the fact that I took care of him. I don't think he loved me. I think he loved the fact of how much I gave up, how much I would do to make sure that he was okay every single day. Yeah. Every single day. And, like, even in the morning, if I didn't have money and he was dope sick and I was dope sick, I'd give him the drugs that we had left, I'd give it to him, and I'd go work dope sick. Back in December, last December is when we ended it because he got arrested. We were living in a motel room. Because you, okay, so you guys went to treatment separately, (laughs) and then you guys discharged and you went to IOP at daylight, you were sober living at daylight. The day you guys left, I know that they tried to talk to you into like, yeah, maybe separating or someone else going to pick Chris up from work. He just got a job, actually. I think. Yeah, first and, time. Uh, and he had maybe punched a hole. In- he punched a hole in the closet at the sober house, and even the entire time that I was sober with him, we first met back up with each mm-hmm. other. Like, I was happy to see him. And, like, yeah, yeah. There was love there, obviously, because I loved him. As like the days went on, and like I was sober and stuff, and he was sober, I just really just didn't like him like I didn't want to be around him he didn't want me having friends and like, comparing where he was in his recovery with mine and like that I wasn't where I needed to be and whatever I mean, so you were starting to see that you guys maybe weren't the best match yeah. when you were you know at least sober yeah and then you guys we, used we used while we were at daylight and then you're kind of stuck together again yeah <laughs> so we went back on a run mm-hmm. and I remember we came to daylight a couple times. Like we went yeah, to I remember you guys came back here, and I was like, because you had overdosed a few times. Yeah, on, I had seizures. On coke, I think, right? It wasn't yeah. even uh, heroin overdose. I had it was seizures. So, yeah. Like, we were staying at the motel, and I had a seizure. And then less than 20 hours later, I had another seizure. Instead of Chris calling an ambulance, he recorded me having a seizure for 10 minutes. What? Yeah. So, like, we came to daylight to try and detox. We were here for less than 24 hours. AMA came yep. back, mm-hmm. left again, then we kept running. And when you left, the first time you were like, Allie, because I was like, yo, what? I don't know, like, please come, let us come back. Yeah, and you're like, I'm sorry, that was such a big mistake. I don't know why we did that. Can we please come back? Yeah. And, you know, you guys came back, and then you, like, left again. Like, what was going on? I wanted to leave. He didn't want to be there. Like, I didn't want him to go out without me. What's your advice for someone who's going to treatment with? I wouldn't go together. When you're in a relationship and you go to rehab together, you're not focused on getting sober and like what your life is gonna be like. You're more focused on like how the other one's doing, if the other one's okay, and if they get mad and they throw a fit and they mm-hmm. wanna leave, you're gonna pack your stuff up and go too. You can't say you're not going to because you're going to. Yeah. You're not gonna leave someone you love because you wanna stay here. Like right. it's just not gonna happen. But like, leaving Chris was, like, the best thing that has happened to me. So, okay, when, so you guys were together, all together, how long? Like, a year and a half. Mm-hmm. So we, and I like, mainly like, using the whole time. You guys had, how much yeah. sober time did you have at, like, when you were in sober living? Until, Two like, months. Like, you guys got to, like, 60 days? Yeah. Okay. And, um. And he blamed us relapsing on me. I remember him reaching out to people at daylight, like, when we were living in the motels and, like, if Rachel didn't do this, we'd still be at daylight. Like, she fucked everything up, like blah, 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 blah. Doing everything on me. And like, he was helping me pimp, my, pimp myself out. And he was like- And was that frustrating for you for like, 
Yeah, it was still how people thought. Or yeah, I got kind of mad at the episode too because, like, oh, I yeah, how did it feel? So where were you when the show came out? We were living in a motel room. Okay. And, and you watched it? Oh uh, yeah, we had to go to his mom's house to watch it because it didn't have TV in the motel room. And like what? Like oh my god. It's actually kind of crazy because it was a day after my birthday and we're recording this a day after my son's birthday. <laughs> It was your 21st birthday, because I promised you that we would go out dancing. That was our thing, remember? Yeah. We never got to do it. Maybe for 22. Yeah. That'll be fun. So, yeah. Okay, so it was the day after your birthday. Okay, so you go to his mom's house, which she's cool. I like his mom. Yeah, she's very enabling, though. Yeah, as most mothers that I've learned are yours, no. totally not. <laughs> but, no, but she would give us but, money whenever she yeah, wanted. Yeah, she's a nice woman though yeah. like she cared about you you know yeah she did and that's like kind of like what my con was of breaking up with Chris this was leaving his family behind yeah, yeah. because I didn't have that motherly yeah. love and I had his mom and like I still love his mom to death and whatever but so you being... guys go there to watch the show yeah what did, and what he was, was pissed like? oh Allie but you know he, yeah. he had a, this whatever like, against you yeah for the whole time yeah the entire time but he was like oh whatever i don't even want to watch this blah blah, blah. Allie, Allie lied to us the entire time that was his whole thing you lied to us you about lied to what us. i didn't even know that i don't i have no idea that was his thing though you <laughs> lied to him and that you hated him and that you made it seem like we were this and that on the tv show i was more annoyed because he was a douchebag, and he basically controlled the entire time what I could say and what I couldn't say, and like him being the star of the show, everything was like my fault. And like I was, it was my choice to go stripping and my choice to go sell my body. But like, dude, you're right behind the screen texting guys, right. setting up things, and then sitting in. You the know backyard. that was nice of them to leave out a lot of the stuff that they did have yeah. on camera. You know, Chris was just like. He was always so angry at when anyone even brought up the idea of, like, your work. Yeah. You know, he, he was very, like... It was Rachel's idea. Rachel's yeah. idea. Rachel's idea. Because I hate myself. You remember stripping and doing all that, being your idea, your idea, your idea. Rachel's yeah. idea. Rachel's idea. Like, that was always, like... So you can tell there was guilt there, though, mm -hmm. because of his reaction with it. Yeah, and now for as many months as I haven't been with him, mm -hmm. I see him reaching out to vulnerable girls and he did the whole cycle starting all over again. And she actually told me that he tried pissing so, her out. You've, you've been to treatment a couple of times since the whole Chris thing yeah. happened, right? By and myself, I've been in and out, in and out, in and out kind of a couple of times. How much time do you have today? I have three months. I thought it was two months. I my mind was all <laughs> messed up. But so you have three months. Yeah. And like for all the things you've been through, what has helped you get through all of that? What um, do you think has been most helpful? Looking towards like what my life can be. Looking at all my mistakes of like going back to drugs, like nothing good has come out of it at all. Having like people who actually like care about you. I've cut so many negative people out of my life that just used me for their own benefit and like now having people in my life that actually like call me to like see how I'm doing yeah. and to make everybody happy and make sure I'm happy. Like, I still have issues to this day. I'm not perfect. And what, what do you think therapeutic wise has been the most helpful to help you maybe like reconcile some of the things from your past? Cause I'm someone who keeps a lot of stuff in and like someone told me like, you gotta struggle loudly so you don't die silently. And like, I don't wanna die. I don't think the things I've done should define who I am. Like, and I don't to this day, like I look at like homeless people on the street and like drug addicts that I've seen on the street and stuff. But, I like go buy them something because I know what it's like. Even like girls, I saw her out on the street and like I let her come stay with me because like I know what it's like to be yeah. so alone. Like, yeah. You feel like you have nobody and being in that active cycle and like, not feeling like you can get out. But there is a way out and my son is like my driving force because like I really just want to be a good mom and like I want to give him back all the time that was lost and like, make up for it. No one can do it. It just it's gonna take work. It's not just, I mean, it's one day at a time. Yeah. I know it's cliche, but. It really it is. is. 
So what do you, so you said, like, what is your main support group right now? Like, what do you do regularly that, like... Right now, I go to church more than anything and celebrate recovery and... The Which is super support. popular. Yeah. The I hear su- it's awesome and, yeah. like, really fun. And, like, if you, like, have, like, an okay thing with God and, like, you don't struggle with that, like, that's a really cool thing to get into and, like, the support group there is, like, with the... They separate the girls and the guys. And that's cool. Yeah, so yeah. That's, you have a... So you're around a bunch of woman, females, yeah. and have you made friends with them? Yeah. Yeah, yeah okay, like, cool, yeah. Yeah, so I talk to them, and it's it's very cool. I definitely think the separation of, like, not getting into a relationship, not going back to past relationships has definitely, like, done good for me. Yeah. Yeah. And if there's one thing that you could tell a girl out there that is going through that's just struggling you know that's been through any of those stages that you've been for help anything i've gone through or like if you're struggling with anything depression bullying addiction whatever it is like talk to somebody because like if you're stuck in your head you're gonna feed yourself so many lies that you're not good enough that you that maybe you should kill yourself like whatever it is your mind's gonna take over and you're gonna end up doing what your mind tells you to do. My mind has overtaken so many thoughts and like people have tried to help me and I've shut them out and that has harmed me more than me letting people help me. Yeah. So, and do you continue to do any kind of therapy or? Uh, I mean, as of right now, I just go to church and I go to church more than one time a week and Mm -hmm. I go to Celebrate Recovery and I have that support group. So as of right now, no. I do think with what I've been struggling with lately, I do need to put myself back into therapy, but, and I probably am going to, because like I said, I'm not gonna sit here and struggle yeah, in my head. Because, like even this week you've been so, you know, super sad with yeah. like Mason's birthday and everything. So like, maybe that's something we can work on. Yeah. Monday. So that you have someone to talk to who you can trust, you know? Um, and you live in a safe place right now? Yeah, a sober, sober environment. Uh-huh. And I'm actually looking into going and starting school in what? September. For what? What do you what do you want to do? Esthetician. So Cool, love yeah. that. I just wanna like do all the things that I wanted to do before I started doing drugs. Yeah, you're still young and you have your whole life ahead of you. Yeah. And yeah. I can totally see what, like facial wise, or yeah. you wanna like do makeup, makeup or what. Makeup and, yeah. I don't know, I wanna do so many things. I know I can, like I don't want, I don't want this to like, what I've gone through to find who I am and let it take over my life. Mm-hmm. And I tell people all the time, I'm like, I'm someone who like is in recovery, but I'm, all, I'm just like a regular human. Yeah. You know, like, I like things, and I like... Yeah, it's I don't not like all to be about like, that. you're an addict. Like, you're a person. Like, right, yeah. You know? Like, I'm everybody like, has their flaws, but know, they look at addiction as so much worse. As a moral yeah. issue, you know, when it really isn't. And it's yeah. like, okay, so I've struggled with this, but I love to make art, and I like to do yoga, and I like to play with makeup, and I yeah. like cats, and I don't really love dogs. And, right, like, you start to learn things that you like. Like, what are some things that you've learned that you really enjoy or like to do? I mean, I love to shop. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I do. I, I mean, I love doing, like, I'll do with other girls' makeup and other girls' hair. And, uh-huh. like, I just, like, I love doing that. I just like being around girls and laughing and, like, having, like, a good time because I haven't had, like, an actual, like, through all those years, like, actually, like, a genuine laugh and smile, yeah. like, in a really long time, so it feels good to, like, have those kind of people Group around off you. and just yeah. have fun, yeah. And you talk to your dad? Yeah, I still talk, I still talk to my family, I mean, yeah, my, me and my mom still kind of have a bumpy road, but, I mean, time heals, so. Anything you want to say about your mom before you wrap this up? I mean... I love her. I don't. I think she has a lot of resentments, and I can't blame her. But like I've tried, like telling her, like the one thing I want is I just want my mom back. Like yeah. I just want to feel like I have my mom because it sucks when you don't feel like you have your mom when you when they're still alive. Like yeah. time flies, and yeah. like you can't get time back. Yeah, time is so, a commodity. Yeah.
Well, I know, like, I was so excited because when your episode came out, I know that you were in, like, a dark place even when, like, when that happened, Mm -hmm. right? And I'm sure, like, when someone's in that place, they only see the negative, Yeah. you know? But, like, there were so many people who were, who could relate to you, you know? Like, they really related to you a lot. And I don't know, like, just know that, like... I know. I know I'm not alone, and I know that, like... The one thing, too, is that, like, I've been through so many struggles that I know that I'm, like, not the only person that's, like, still going through, like, and that, like, there is a way out, like, that's why when you reached out to me, I was like, yeah, like, because I didn't feel like my story was really told on that episode. And, yeah. Like, and I'm so excited that you got to yeah. tell more. Is there anything else? You're not alone. Everyone loves you. By the way, we're at daylight right now, and I thought it was really funny because the last time Rachel was here, she... I AMA'd. AMA'd. Twice. But now she's here of her own will and stayed the entire time. <laughs> and and um, she's eating milk and cookies, and that's been fun. Yeah. I love Allie. She's awesome. <laughs> she really is. You're, like, one of my favorite people when we were filming. I, like, you get, a, like, a relationship with that with, like, random people, you know? Yeah. Who you just, like, enjoy and you want to see them do well, and I've always wanted to see you do well. So. I know, I definitely, like, we've kept in contact ever since then, and, like, yeah, I'm, like, even you with my family, too, and my dad, like, you talk, I talked to Allie. Yeah. I'm like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I love you, though. Seriously. I love you, too, Rachel. Bye, Rachel. Love you.